Good morning, Pine Heaven family. I trust that this message uh, will find you well this morning. Your session wrestled with what the best course of action to take would be given the rising infections in our small number. Uh, and um, we, with reluctance, did decide unanimously that the most prudent thing to do would be to suspend in-person gatherings for the next two weeks. So this week and next, and we're eager to reconvene with you in our normal manner after that. Uh, that being said, let me direct you to a few announcements. Uh, Larkin is doing much better. His numbers improve, and they've been able to lower his, his oxygen and his nitrous and his, his oxygen numbers hold good. So let's thank God for that. Also, uh, Leon Hemphill continues to make improvement. So if you do have a prayer request, which we would normally hear at this time, do please email the church office or you can text or call one of your elders. That being said, um, let's take a moment and prepare our hearts to worship God. Amen. The call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm chapter 57 and verse 1. Uh, hear now the word of God. Be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. Uh, amen. Let's pray. O oh God, our Father in heaven, you have been merciful to us. You have sheltered us and you have uh, given us all that we need. You have watched over us and you have provided us with abundance. And we thank you this morning. We um, lift up your great name today and we uh, profess our faith in you, our dependence upon you, and our love for you, because you have loved us first. You have held nothing back from us. You have sent even your son to come into the world and to live amongst us and to be one of us and to be sacrificed on behalf of us. And so for this, we praise you. For this, we declare our loyalty to our King, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would enable our worship this morning. We pray that you would um, bring us back quickly into our normal manner of gathering. We pray that you would preserve us and keep us uh, from infection and harm. We lift up these things to you this morning. And we pray that you would aid us in our worship. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. If you would turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Jeremiah chapter 51. And our reading this morning is taken from Jeremiah chapter 51 verses 45 through 57. Uh, in this passage, we will continue to read of the coming downfall of Babylon, that though Babylon was an instrument uh, of discipline and the hand of God used to chasten his people for their unfaithfulness to his covenant, Babylon yet would not escape retribution for the evil and the harm that they inflicted upon the Israelites and other people of the region. In this passage, we see not only the justice and the wrath of God against his enemies, but also his all-encompassing providence and covenant faithfulness. He tells his people who are exiled in Babylon to flee and to remember Yahweh and Jerusalem, to realize his nearness to them, 
and to latch on to this hope that there is a glorious future for Jerusalem. And we know on the other side of history uh, that the Son of God would come into the world and he would bring his kingdom with him, that he would inherit the world and the borders of Jerusalem would expand to the very ends of the earth. And it's this glorious future that has brought us near to the kingdom as those who were once far off and without hope. And it is this glorious future that we await the consummation of. Having said these things, let's take up and read together Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 47, 45 through 57. Come forth from her midst, my people, and each of you save yourselves from the fierce anger of the Lord. Now so that your heart does not grow faint, and you are not afraid at the report that will be heard in the land, for the report will come one year, and after that another report in another year. And violence will be in the land, with ruler against ruler. Therefore, behold, days are coming when I will punish the idols of Babylon, and her whole land will be put to shame, and all her slain will fall in her midst." Then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon, for the destroyers will come to her from the north, declares the Lord. Indeed, Babylon is to fall for the slain of Israel, as also for Babylon the slain of all the earth have fallen. You who have escaped the sword, depart, do not stay. Remember the Lord from afar and let Jerusalem come to your mind. We are ashamed because we have heard reproach. Disgrace has covered our face. For aliens have entered the holy place of the Lord's house. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish her idols. And the mortally wounded will groan throughout her land. Though Babylon should ascend to the heavens, and though she should fortify her lofty stronghold, from me destroyers will come to her, declares the Lord. The sound of an outcry from Babylon and of great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans. For the Lord is going to destroy Babylon and he will make her loud noise vanish from her. And their waves will roar like many waters. The tumult of their voices sound forth. For the destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon. And her mighty men will be captured, their bows shattered. For the Lord is a God of recompense. He will fully repay I will make her princes and her wise men drunk, her governors, her prefects, and her mighty men. They may sleep, that they may sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake up, declares the king whose name is the Lord of hosts. Thus ends the reading of this portion of God's word. May he add his rich blessing to it. Let's now profess together our faith using Heidelberg Catechism question and answer 64. Uh, Heidelberg Catechism question 64 arises quite naturally out of question and answer 63, which we read last week. Um, So that question was, how can our good works be said to merit nothing when God promises to reward them in this life and the next? And the answer is that this reward is not earned, it is a gift of grace. So, uh, uh, 64 arises to answer the quite natural objection to that truth, which is that, well, won't people just be terrible? Um, Won't they care nothing about righteousness or holiness if this is the case? And so uh, question 64 answers that, um, and its answer is rooted in the the biblical truth that that you will know a tree by its fruits. So uh, let's take up and read together uh, question 64. I'll read the question, and uh, together we'll read the answer. Does this teaching not make people careless and wicked? No. It is impossible that those grafted into Christ by true faith should not bring forth fruits of thankfulness. Uh, And indeed, we, as those who have been claimed by him, have much to be thankful for, and we should um, express out of gratitude in our obedience um, our thankfulness. Let's pray. Bless the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak. 
stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. Oh God, you, you are great and you have been compassionate to us. You have been a good and kind father to us. You who have created the universe, the stars, you who uh, hold the waters of the earth in your palm, you who spoke all things into existence, you, O oh God, the Almighty One, have set your love and your affection upon us. How can we comprehend, begin to comprehend such a wonderful thing? It's too good for us. Uh, we, we confess that we have not praised you as we ought. We have not thought of you this week uh, as we ought. We have not um, read your word and we have not visited you in prayer We've not kept your word. We confess to you that we have been idolatrous and adulterous and unfaithful in our dealings with you. And we uh, confess that we have been unkind and cruel and impatient and not gentle with those around us, that we have uh, thought so highly of ourselves that so we are puffed up Lord, humble us. We confess our sin to you. We confess that we are unrighteous and unworthy to draw near to you. Except, except for the blood of Christ. That the righteousness of him who was made to be our substitute has been given and granted to us. Apart from that, we are utterly unworthy. And so we Rejoice in your salvation. Make us walk rightly in accordance with it. Give us obedience. Grant that we would be eager to worship you, to study your word, uh, and to love those around us. We, uh, oh God, lift up to you the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, for your people there, we ask that you would give them safety if they choose to remain, and we pray that you would give them a safe passage if they wish uh, to escape, relocate, we pray that you would give them courage and strong hearts. We pray that you would give us compassion, uh, grant that we would be vigilant in prayerfulness for them and for your persecuted church throughout the world. We, we pray with the psalmist, O oh God, rise up, O oh Lord, confront them, bring them down, rescue them from the wicked by your sword or, or repay them for their deeds, for their evil work, repay them for what their hands have done and bring back upon them what they deserve. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer, call his wickedness to account till you find none. Pour out your wrath on the nations do not, that do not acknowledge you or the kingdoms that do not call on your name for they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. At the same time, we know that you are a God of compassion and of mercy and that uh, you desire uh, that no one be destroyed in their sinfulness. And so we pray, O oh God, that you would, at the same time that you defend your people and that you scatter your enemies, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on those who don't know you and those who are opposed to you, those who hate you, 
that you would give the gift of regeneration to them as you have given to us, as you gave to men uh, like the Apostle Paul who abandoned their violence and their wickedness and sought you. We pray that you uh, would, would indeed turn the hearts um, of wicked men in Afghanistan and around the world, uh, that you would turn them to you um, out of your abundance of mercy and loving kindness, um, that you would do this thing, pour out your spirit. We pray uh, for those servicemen who bravely and courageously fight for those who are helpless, those who um, have no way, no means to defend themselves, who are weak. Uh, we pray for those who would be experiencing defeat and despair uh, right now as they see these events unfold in Afghanistan. Comfort them and strengthen them, we pray. Bind up their wounds, O merciful one. Uh, we lift up also to, to you those who are sick. Uh, for uh, Anita Hemphill, who is, who is fighting off staff, um, or not staff, but strep. We pray for Larkin and Leon uh, as they contend with COVID-19. We pray for Harold Jones. Uh, who is waiting to have a heart procedure performed, uh, and for his grandson, Christopher, who is COVID positive, uh, we pray that he would heal quickly and without complication. We pray also for those with cancer. We pray for Vicki Minor. Uh, she recovers from her surgery. We pray for Mike Lockhart. We pray for Alan Stanton, that he would have uh, a clear scan and that his recovery would continue. Uh, we pray for Tim Cole, and Ty Ashford, Rachel Molly, Ann Welch, Bobby Welch, Jay Welch, Andrew McCall, Palmer Robertson, and Joyce DeKine. Uh, all of these uh, we lift up to you that in your mercy you would ease their suffering and that you would draw near to them in their distress, heal their bodies, and strengthen their hearts, O oh God. Uh, we pray for our missionary of the month, Jeff Jordan, as he labors at Mississippi College with RUF. We pray that you would give him um, a, a productive start to this semester. We pray that you would provide his financial needs, that you would um, grant that people would be generous in opening up uh, their, their hearts and their wallets to the, um, to the needs of RUF. We pray. Uh, that RUF would uh, see a great harvest uh, this year at Mississippi College, and we pray that the lives of those college students would be, um, receive a great impact uh, that, would, that would benefit them for the rest of their lives. Um, we, we know that you have um, been so good to give uh, our RUF students um, strong work ethic and uh, that you have given them uh, intelligence and skill. We pray for them that they would use their gifts well, that they would learn well during this time at college, and we pray that you would um, help them to be diligent, that you would give them a good experience, and that you would keep them from temptation and the evil one, that you would build them up and strengthen them in their faith, uh, that you would prepare them for the role and the good works that you have laid out for them um, throughout their college career and also as they go on to become young adults and even leaders in your church, we pray that you uh, would bless them in their work. We lift up now to you, Dr. Fesco, and the message that he has prepared. Uh, we pray that you would give us ears to hear, that we might be um, eager to learn from you and that we would be transformed by the preaching of your word supernaturally, by the application of the Holy Spirit of it to our hearts, that we would be transformed into the image of your beloved Son. We do um, pray for this pandemic that you would blot it out and that you would remove it 
from us quickly. We pray that you would bring us back together, uh, meeting together in person quickly. Um, we do pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. We'll now hear from Dr. Fesco. It is good to be with you, uh, to be able to bring you the uh, word of the Lord this morning on Sunday. Uh, obviously, these are not ideal circumstances and that I know that we would all rather be gathered together in person. But under the circumstances, we can nevertheless give thanks to the Lord for the fact that we do have the opportunity through the use of uh, technology, which can be a good gift from God, uh, to be able to have worship even if it's in this uh, altered manner. We should, of course, be in prayer that the Lord would uh, ensure that, we, that he heals everybody who has been ex uh, that has come down with the virus and that he would protect all of us uh, from getting infected. And I would say especially this is the case uh, with Pastor Stanton. We want to make sure that he stays healthy and that uh, under no circumstances does he in any way uh, have this virus become a problem for him uh, in addition to trying to recover from his cancer treatment. That being said, uh, I'm going to open us in a brief word of prayer, and then I'll read the Word of God, and then after reading the passage uh, for this morning's message, then we'll get into the message itself. So let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we are grateful, even if it's under these uh, different circumstances, to be able to gather together and to worship you. We pray that even though we are separated and are apart from one another physically uh, for this Sunday, that you would nevertheless remind us uh, both by your word, but also through your spirit and presence within us, that you have bound us together in Christ through the spirit and that we share this bond uh, no matter the uh, distance that is between us. We ask, Lord, that as we give thought to your word and as I preach it, that you would give us ears to hear, uh, that you would uh, plow the fallow ground of our hearts and that you would uh, sow the seed of the gospel deep within that it would produce fruit in our lives, and that it would bring glory unto your name. We pray and ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, this morning's message uh, comes to us uh, from uh, Hebrews chapter 7 as we continue to make our way through the book of Hebrews, and I'll be reading <clears throat> verses 11 through 28. So let's give attention to the reading of God's word. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life, for it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And if it was not without an oath, and it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord is sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds this priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the utmost, uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests who offer, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. May God add his blessing to this reading uh, from his holy and inspired word. In our culture, I think much of uh, marketing that we see 
uh, tells us that what is new is better than what is old. Uh, Henry Ford said that uh, uh, we do not make changes for the sake of making them, but we never fail to make a change when once it is demonstrated that the new way is better than the old way. This is perhaps something that is built into the warp and woof of marketing in our culture, is that if there's a change, it of course has to be for the better. And so if it's something that is new, it is something that is better, it is therefore to be preferred to what is old. But within the history of the church, on the other hand, uh, there's a different type of mindset that, uh, that really kind of animates our thought, and that we have historically been taught that uh, what is new is typically suspect, and what is old is to be preferred to what is new. Charles Hodge, for example, great theologian from Princeton Seminary back in the 19th century, said, I have never advanced a new idea and have never aimed to improve on the doctrines of our fathers. And he was making this statement with respect to the Westminster Standards. In other words, the received tradition that we have inherited, we believe it is biblical, and therefore there is no need to improve upon it. Well, I think it's perhaps this type of attitude, the idea that what is old is what is trustworthy, is what has colored the thought of many first century Jewish Christians. As a people, they embraced the law of God and the promises of the gospel for nearly 2,000 years. And now in the face of persecution, many perhaps thought that as they embraced Christ, they made a mistake. They thought perhaps they had embraced something novel. They had embraced something that was unprecedented and therefore they needed to return to the old ways. And so what the author has been doing, the author of the book of Hebrews, is he's been showing the superiority of Christ's priestly office and uh, work. And he continues to explain why Christ's high priestly office and his work is superior to the Mosaic priests or to the Levitical priests. And he's been doing this in chapter 7, and he continues to do this in the rest of chapter 7, verses 11 through 28. And so we want to understand what the author means, especially here, as he points to the superiority of Christ's ministry, of what he means when he says that Christ is the guarantor of a better covenant. What does he mean by that? And why is Christ as our guarantor far superior than anything that we might find in the Old Testament? In order to understand this, we want to see what the author has to say about the superiority of Christ's priestly work. First, in terms of his power over death. Secondly, the fact that Christ's priesthood rests upon the Father's oath. And then third and finally, we want to see that how Jesus, as our high priest, is not only the high priest, but he is also very much unlike the Old Testament priests because he is both priest and sacrifice. So let's take a look first at what the author has to say about the superiority of Christ's high priestly office and his work by means of his power over death. Uh, why is Jesus' priesthood superior to the Levitical priests? Well, the author gives us first of several key reasons, but he begins to heighten the irony of Jesus' priesthood. And the law is very clear. Only the sons of Aaron were supposed to serve as priests. And yet, what are we to make of the fact that Jesus is not a Levite, but he's a descendant of Judah, as the author points out in verse 14. How can somebody from the line of Judah serve as a priest? The author notes the change, and that the priestly line would therefore require a change in, in the law. Verse 12, for when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Now, keep in mind, the author here is in no way trying to denigrate diminish or despise the law of God, but rather he's just showing that God designed the Mosaic law with an embedded principle of planned obsolescence. What do I mean by that? What is planned obsolescence? Well, we see this all the time in the technology that we use. It used to be that you, know, you could buy a cell phone and in that cell phone, you could open the back of the cell phone and you could see your battery. And if your battery wore out, you didn't need to buy a whole new cell phone. All you needed to do is to buy a new battery. 
And so you could replace the battery and you could keep your cell phone, typically for longer periods of time than you can with present day cell phones. With present day cell phones, many companies build them in such a manner as to render them obsolete so that when it's, if, if you need to replace a battery or you need to replace a part, you can't really do that. And instead you just simply have to buy a new phone. And in other words, a cell phone might last maybe two to three years before you have to get rid of it and get a new one. That's planned obsolescence. If they plan that the, the, the device itself will automatically become obsolete within a certain time frame, it forces you to upgrade to that new phone. It not only forces you to upgrade to that new phone, it also uh, puts more money in the cell phone company's pocket, okay? Now, while the ethics and the business practices of planned obsolescence are certainly questionable, it's a different matter when we're talking about the Mosaic Law as a whole uh, as, and, and, and Jesus's relationship to it. In other words, God designed the Mosaic economy, the Mosaic covenant, with an embedded principle of planned obsolescence. We can think of it this way, that the Mosaic Covenant was never intended to be God's final word about salvation. It was never terminal, but only temporary. The Mosaic Covenant points forward ultimately to the New Covenant and to the person and work of Christ. So we can say that the Mosaic Covenant was a way station on the way to Christ, but certainly not the final destination. There is therefore a planned principle of embedded obsolescence within the Mosaic economy. Now that means that the Levitical priesthood was supposed to give way to the superior priesthood of Christ. We see this in verses 15 and 16. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Now, as we saw last week, God directly appointed Jesus to his priesthood, just as he appointed Melchizedek to his priesthood. But notice why Christ's priesthood is superior. Again, he says there in verses 15 and 16, when another priest arises, this is the same language that the New Testament uses for the resurrection of Christ. Christ arose from the dead. And the author highlights this point by saying that he has the power of an indestructible life. In other words, the author of Hebrews is drawing attention to the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus lives eternally. Death has no hold upon him. By contrast, all of the Levitical priests lie dead in the grave. They have returned to the dust, even though generation after generation has served as priests. So this means if Christ is our great high priest and he has conquered death, and even more so, he has been raised from the dead and he lives eternally, why would anyone want to abandon his priesthood for the temporary generational, dust-to-dust, -dust, ashes ashes-to-ashes priesthood of the Levites. Note how the author, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, characterizes the Mosaic economy as well as the Levitical priesthood when he says in verses 18 and 19, For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Now, were it not spirit-inspired scripture, we might think that to say that the law of God in the Old Testament was weak and useless would be sinful or even blasphemous. But yet, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the author of Hebrews is saying that the Mosaic law, as it pertains to the priests, was weak and useless, especially in contrast to the perfect priesthood of Jesus Christ. Such is the nature of the Levitical priesthood in comparison with the death-conquering work of Christ, our high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So why, why, if Jesus Christ has conquered death and has been raised from the dead and serves eternally as our high priest, 
Why would they want to go back to the Levitical priesthood? Why would they seek comfort, shelter, and solace in anyone or anything else other than Jesus? Death, as we know, has an insatiable appetite, ravenously consuming people generation after generation, young and old, healthy and infirm, male and female, and yet Jesus is greater than death because he has defeated it through his life by living a perfect uh, life of obedience to the law. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, uh, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. In the face of death, therefore, what the author of Hebrews is saying is look to Jesus Christ, your great high priest, he who has conquered death. This is one of the big reasons as to why we want to stick with the high priesthood of Jesus and set aside the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament. But now the author gives us a second reason as to why we want to take shelter in the high priesthood of Christ, and that's because it rests upon the Father's oath. You see, Christ's priesthood is superior to the Levitical priesthood because as the author has noted, it doesn't rest upon a genealogical line of descent, but upon God's direct appointment. Verse 17, for it is witnessed of him. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Or in verses 20 and 21, and it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made so, uh, made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Now this is a significant explanation here as the, as the author quotes Psalm 110 verse 4 because he says that the Father swore an oath to Jesus which constituted his appointment as our high priest. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek and it was not without an oath. And what this oath constitutes is we may not recognize it as such but swearing an oath is tantamount to making a covenant, to making a binding agreement with somebody. You see this, for example, in Psalm 105, verses 8 and following. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise or oath to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. So what the author is saying is he's saying that the father made a covenant with the son and swore to him and said, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, what's the significance of this? Well, the significance is, is that God's word is sure. It is certain. It is unfailing. Unlike the shifting sand of the genealogical descent of the Levitical priests, a line that was indeed broken for a time during Israel's exile when they were carted off into captivity, into Babylon, God's promises never fail. Remember the words of the prophet Isaiah, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And if we know this, the certainty, the surety, uh, the, 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 the unbreakable nature of God's word, then this is something that gives us assurance about the superiority of Christ's high priestly office and work in contrast to the Levitical priests. And it's by God's word, by his covenantal oath, that he has appointed Jesus as high priest to the specific end when he says in verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of, of a better covenant. What does it mean? What does this mean when he says that by, by this covenantal oath, he makes Jesus the guarantor of a covenant? Well, let's, let's unpack this, you know, element by element. First, he says this of Jesus. We don't want to pass by the fact that everything the author says here is about Jesus, not about Moses, not about Joshua, not about Aaron, not about Melchizedek. He says it first and foremost about Jesus. Secondly, he says that Jesus is a guarantor. He's a guarantor. What's a guarantor? Well, a guarantor is somebody who takes all of the legal obligations of a covenant upon himself. He's not merely a co-signer of a loan. 
I remember when I bought my first car, my father was a co-signer for my car loan. And what the, 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 the principles involved in being a co-signer are is that if I had failed to make the payments, my father would take them over for me and he would ensure that I would make the payments. In the case of a guarantor, a guarantor is far more than a co-signer. A guarantor says, I will take all of the legal obligations of the covenant upon myself. If this were a loan, a guarantor would essentially say, I will take the obligations and I will make all of the loan payments for you. But if we're talking about a covenant to redeem sinners, then when the author says that Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant, he means that Jesus takes all of the responsibilities, both of fulfilling the requirements of the law, as well as paying the penalty for breaking the law. What does Paul says, say in Galatians 3.13? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is uh, everyone who is hanged on a tree. This means that as guarantor, Jesus is not only high priest, but he also gave his life and sacrifice for us, and he fulfilled all of the obligations of the covenant for us. But third, we see that it's not only Jesus, he's not only the guarantor, but thirdly, he's the guarantor of a better covenant. The fact that he says this about Jesus, the fact that Jesus is a guarantor, and there is nobody else in all of redemptive history that is a guarantor, this is what makes the new covenant, a better covenant than the Mosaic covenant. Remember, the Mosaic covenant was temporary. It had a principle of planned obsolescence embedded in it because it was ultimately looking forward to the revelation of Jesus in the new covenant. And so all of this begs the question, why would you want to go back to the Mosaic covenant? If, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 24, that Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, and by his wounds we have been healed. Why would we turn back to the Old Testament? This ultimately is a truth that has to fill our hearts with faith. John Owen once wrote, fill your affections with the cross of Christ that there may be no room for sin. If the author's audience, if the recipients of his letter looked to the cross of Christ so much so that it so consumed the eyes of their faith, they would have no desire to return to the Old Testament ways. They would recognize that they would be trying to do the impossible, to try to turn back the clock of redemptive history as if Jesus had not come. And yet, if they were truly to meditate, pray upon, and to look at the cross of Christ in faith, they would recognize by divine revelation and the work of the Spirit all that Jesus has accomplished in his crucifixion, all that Jesus had done for them, and how far superior he was to the Levitical priests. If Christ's cross fills our affections, I think then the temptation to seek other means of salvation will never hold sway over us whether it's in the temptations to, to return to the Mosaic Covenant, which was the original threat for the, for the audience of the book of Hebrews, or rather in seeking salvation by other means in our own day. This brings us to our third and final point, which is recognizing that Jesus is superior to the Levitical priests because he is both priest and sacrifice. Christ's priesthood is superior because he is better than the Levitical priests. What does the author say in verses 23 and following? Uh, they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. So notice this contrast. He's superior to the Levitical priests because he lives forever. Unlike them, he lives. They die. They cannot make intercession. He makes intercession now and forever. But Christ is also able to save because unlike the Levites who were themselves sinful, 
Jesus is perfectly righteous. Verses 26 and 27. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. And listen to this series of adjectives. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted in the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. This is something that stands out as a massive contrast. Not only Jesus' sinlessness, because remember, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest had to offer a sacrifice for himself to cleanse himself ritually of all sin, to remind himself and the people of Israel that he too was guilty of sin. Not so. Not so with the sacrifice of Jesus. Not only is Jesus our high priest, but he is sinless. And in an irony of ironies, the sinless one nevertheless offered up himself in sacrifice for sinners. He sacrificed himself as if he were sinful because he himself bears our sins. And he is the one true sacrifice that frees us from the guilt, the debt, the shame, and the weight of sin. No other sacrifice has ever accomplished this ever in the history of redemption. Only the sacrifice of Jesus. And this is why he says, since he did this once for all, when he offered up himself. What did the Levitical priests have to do? Every morning and every evening. And repeat and repeat and repeat. Sacrifices every morning and every evening. But not Jesus. When Jesus cried out upon the cross, Tadalestai, it is finished. It was once and for all. It was done. His sacrifice was complete. And it's the sacrifice that frees us from the curse of the law because Jesus became a curse for us. This is what lies at the heart of the high priestly office of Christ is that he offers himself up as the perfect sacrifice for us. This was chiefly God's supreme act of love. He gave his only begotten son to save us from our sins. Octavius Winslow, a 19th century uh, theologian, says, Who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money. Not Pilate for fear. Not the Jews for envy. But the Father for love. It was the Father's love that delivered up Jesus as our sacrifice, as our high priest, to save us from our sins. And so this is yet a third reason as to why the author of Hebrews is saying, why on earth would you want to turn back to the sacrificial system, that which ultimately cannot save you, that which cannot cleanse you from sin? Why would you turn back to these priests who cannot save you or cleanse you from sin? To turn away from Christ and his high priestly office and sacrifice is essentially to turn away from the deepest manifestation of God's love for sinners. Christ's sacrifice was an outpouring of love, something that no Levite ever did for any of God's people. Yes, they served God's people, but none of them sacrificed themselves in the way that Christ did. The Levites always offered something else up for sacrifice, a sacrificial animal or an offering. But as our high priest, Christ took our cup of grief. He took our cup of the curse he pressed it to its, his lips and he drank it to its bitter dregs. And then he then filled that cup with his sweet, pardoning, sympathizing love. And he gave it back to us to drink. And it is a drink that we can consume forever. It is a cup filled not with the curse of God, but with the love of God in Christ through the Spirit. This is why the author of Hebrews is essentially pleading with his, his recipients, do not turn away from Christ. So we want to ask a few concluding questions. Why would the author's fellow Jewish Christians want to turn their backs on Christ? More importantly, at least for us now, why would we want to ever turn our backs on Christ? Why are we often so easily drawn away from Christ by poor substitutes? 
to paraphrase a statement from Octavius Winslow, should the eyes of your faith ever withdraw from Christ's cross, you will surely falter. You will grow cold. You will forget that only Christ has saved you from your sins. Christ's cross is life, health, holiness, consolation, strength, and joy. Let nothing come between it and you. And so, beloved in Christ, we have to pray that in the face of temptation, temptations to turn away from Christ, whether it be in things small, such as in small sins, or in things large, such as walking completely away from Christ, that God would so fill our eyes, the eyes of our faith, with the sight of Christ's cross, that we would look to our Savior, who is both our high priest and our sacrifice, as the only hope of our salvation. We must treasure the truth that Christ is the guarantor of a better covenant and seek shelter in his high priestly work. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the priestly work of Christ and are grateful that you have given us a better covenant and that you have given us Christ, the guarantor of that better covenant. We pray, O oh Lord, that however tempted we might be to abandon Christ, whether it's in ways great or small, that you would fill the sight of our faith with the cross of Christ, that you would so fill our sight with your love in Christ that we would never be led away, that we would never fall away, that no temptation would, uh, would, would win us over, but rather we would take solace solely in the sacrifice of Christ, that we would sh seek shelter in no other embassy of peace. We pray that in this way you would strengthen our faith, we pray, O oh Lord, under these uh, difficult and adverse circumstances where it requires us to be flexible and to change our plans, as well as in some cases, it has even uh, visited illness upon people, such as uh, uh, Elder Larkin and Elder Leon. We pray and ask, O oh Lord, that you would uh, heal them, that you would protect them, that you would keep us all safe from this virus, that you would prevent further infections from growing. O oh Lord, if anything, only for the sake of the ministry of the church, that it can continue unhindered by this virus, we pray that you would answer our prayers. But also for the sake of our personal and individual health, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would do so. We pray for Pastor Stanton, that you would keep him free from infection, that you would continue to heal him, heal his body, heal his mind, that he would be able to return to the pulpit of this church, and that he would once again be able to lead the sheep of Pine Haven. Until that day, O oh Lord, we pray that you would give unto us patience, that you would give us humility, and even above all else, that you would give us cheerful hearts no matter the circumstances because of the knowledge that we have of the assurance of our salvation in Christ, the guarantor of the new covenant. We pray and ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.